Zachary uh, is based at the at the universe at the North, at Northwestern University in Qatar. is an assistant associate professor of history and religious studies. He received his PhD in African history from, from Northwestern University. His MA in Arabic studies and Middle Eastern history from the American University in Cairo, and his BA in history from Stanford University. So I think you've been you've been doing kind of a bit of traveling, and now you are based in Qatar. As we know. Uh, Professor Wright's research fo focuses on Islamic intellectual history in North and West Africa from the 15th century to the present. Uh, he has a number of books to his credit. Uh, most recent one, 2020, Realizing Islam, the Tijaniya in North Africa and the 18th century Muslim world. Jihad of the Pen, the Sufi literature of West Africa, co-authored with Rudolf Weir and Amir Sayyid. Rudolf Roy is also an author that we know, that we know whose book we read earlier, uh, I think that last year. He's also got a book, I would tr uh, try to pronounce the French, but it's a uh, swallow of what the prophet, something, Sheikh Ahmed Tijani and the Tariqa Muhammadiyah in 2018, and uh, Living Knowledge in West African Islam, the Sufi Community of the Ibrahim Niyaz, published in 2015. And he's also translated a number of West African Arabic texts into English, such as the removal of confusion concerning the flood of the saintly seal by Sheikh Ibrahim Niaz in, uh, in 2010. So he's got a number of projects continuing on the intellectual history of uh, Islam in West Africa. And uh, it's really great that you, uh, that you, we can hear you talk about your work, uh, perhaps with a particular emphasis on the book, but you don't necessarily need to be bound by that. You know, that's quite a few years. But uh, it's, it's, uh, so you, you can speak for as long as you like. You said you will speak for about 20 or 25 minutes. I think that we will then follow up with some discussions and comment, comments uh, on that. Please go ahead. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. All right, so I'm, I'm very much uh, honored to, to be here. And um, I really thank you for <clears throat> um, taking the time to read a book uh, such as this one. Um, uh, it was certainly a, a, a pleasure to, to write and more importantly to do the research. Um, and uh, I hope what, you know, the result um, that I hope for is something that um, is legible to the communities that um, are represented in the book, not just um, something that, you know, um, is a normal academic route of, <laughs> of being a sort of utilitarian crutch for, for one's advancement in, in career. Um, I, I would have written this book, um, whether or not it um, was part of my academic trajectory. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and so I would just sort of explain a little bit about the background of how I came to write the book um, and uh, speak about some of the enduring themes that, uh, or uh, namely one of the, the, the key enduring theme as it relates to this question of um, Islamic ethics. Um, that I think really s continues to sustain my <clears throat> um, interest in this field. Um, so, you know, to start with a sort of easy question, uh, as you probably are aware, um, I was uh, Rudolf Weir's first and, uh, and you know, uh, first graduate student um, while Rudolf Weir was uh, is for his academic career. Um, while he was at Northwestern, um, and uh, and he and I had a a, a, a very congenial, close uh, relationship, um, and we were sort of really hashing out. You know, in, in all honesty, he's I think he's a one year older than me. <laughs> um, so when we were when I entered in the graduate program uh, at Northwestern, I'd already taken some time off and uh, thought about different things in other places, uh, whereas he had sort of gone straight through the, his academic trajectory. Um, and anyway, so we were really kind of thinking together through this question of um, what does it mean to know in the Islamic tradition? Uh, what is the nature of Islamic learning? Uh, how do we, and, and really kind of formulating these ideas of embodiment. Um, uh, so my dissertation as a result of those conversations, you know, more specifically employed the, the, the concept of embodiment. Um, and, and, and if you've read his book, you can see where he, uh, how richly he, he deals with that concept. 
um, as my field was more particularly, or my subject area was more particularly with, you know, Sufi practitioners and the ways in which um, uh, ideas of ma'rifat Allah, uh, the gnosis or, you know, experiential knowledge of God uh, were a transformative process of human becoming. I became much, I became sort of uncomfortable with the lack of a, um, a a, a, a close or an approximate Arabic translation for the for the word of embodiment uh, or the concept of embodiment you know so I, you can see I, I walk you through some of that stuff in, in the introduction um, and I, I, and if you read Rudolf Ware's book I think you can see where we're sort of uh, in dialogue um, he, he did remark that I, I criticized him I didn't mean to be openly critical of, of him I, I was sort of just trying to uh, clear the space for for particular the particular engagement. I, I really do think that um, his use of the concept of embodiment is certainly appropriate for the idea of inscription of uh, the Quran on the inside of the, the tablet of the human being. Um, and so that's the sort of academic uh, background to the to the book. Um, the personal background to the book is. Um, my first experience and my long-term exposure to uh, Muslim societies in West Africa, particularly Senegal, uh, where I spent, perhaps spent about three, upwards of three years um, studying and in learning and teaching, uh, also as a volunteer teacher, um, and, you know, studying things from the classical sciences, <clears throat> the classical Islamic sciences, Maliki Filk and other things. Um, and and uh, just generally, you know, participating in um, conversations surrounding uh, knowledge production and transmission. Um, and one of the things that, and it's not only myself. I mean, you know, you know a family investiture. Uh, my, my mother also visited the community, um, and converted to Islam there. Um, you're a small group, so I can have these more personal conversations with you. Um, and uh, my sister also. Um, and, you know, one of the things that was evident to me from the first time uh, I was there was this extraordinary presence that <clears throat> of the, you know, sort of exemplary teacher, in this case, um, Sheikh Hassan Sisi, uh, who died in 2008. Um, and, and the ways in which um, students, uh, spoke about the ability of, of a consummate scholar and uh, perceived wali Allah or saint or friend of God uh, tra to transmit knowledge through the so-called bodily presence. Um, in other words, beyond words. And, um, and so one of the key passages that emerged from uh, the translation that I, here's the translation of the Kashfur Bas that I did in 2010. This was Shay Ibrahim's uh, major work. And uh, so, so what he says, he's quoting uh, Abu Madian here, and then later on, um, uh, Ibn Al-Skandari. And he says, um, the sheikh is someone whom your essence has acknowledged with preference, and whom your innermost being has acknowledged with reverence. The sheikh refines you with his exemplary character, trains you, adaba, uh, trains you by, buying, by, by bowing his head in silence and illuminates your inner being with his radiance. The Sheikh is he who gathers you in his presence and preserves you in his absence. Your Sheikh is not someone from whom you hear. Your Sheikh is someone from whom you receive. Your Sheikh is not someone whose expressions confront you. Your Sheikh is the one whose signals become secreted within you. Your Sheikh is not he who summons you to the door, but he who removes the veil between himself and you. Your Sheikh is not the one whose words challenge you, he is the one whose spiritual state uplifts you. Your sheikh is the one who releases you from the prison of your vain desires and brings you to the presence of the Lord. So it goes on. But um, to, to me, this was a way of putting into words what um, I saw people sort of uh, experiencing. Um, and for me, that really kind of returned me to this notion of knowledge as adab, right? Or an, an the process of knowledge acquisition in the Islamic tradition, which was very explicit with Sufism, 
but in the West African context, was very much um, tied to other uh, elaborations and um, uh, uh, acquisitions of the, the the other Islamic sciences, namely you know, jurisprudence, theology, Quran, learning, etc. All of these were pervaded by a similar pedagogical methodology, which was about character transformation from bodily presence to bodily presence. Um, and so um, that that was kind of how I, um, uh, and, and, and I had a really sort of, the, the sort of few word definition that for me encapsulates this reality that I was experiencing and was also witnessing was this, uh, you know, when I read the narration of some of the people around the Prophet Muhammad um, becoming Muslim just by looking at the face of the Prophet, right? I mean, him and the Prophet explaining, whoever has seen me has seen the real or has seen the truth. Um, and to me, this was something that I was trying to explain. So the, the, the book is really an elaborate attempt to, to explain that, that one sentence. Um, and um, yeah, so the question of ethics, I see that you know, your seminar is uh, framed in the question of ethics. I've, I've purposely delayed a little bit um, uh, asking you to, 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 to tell me a little bit about yourselves. I don't know if other people were, were joining, but I do wanna, uh, we're, we're a small group here. It'd be nice to hear how you guys are engaging with these questions yourselves. Um, but um, so, the, you know, the, the question of ethics is, is obviously an interesting one and has been defined or, you know, varieties of different Arabic words have been um, tied to this and you probably uh, know this better than, than me. Um, fr from my preliminary understanding, it seems that, you know, um, oftentimes ethics is thought about as akhlaq, sometimes it's talk, talked about as adab, you know, in other words, character, uh, adab as, you know, disposition, perhaps. Um, sometimes it's talked about as maqasid al-sharia, right, the sort of ethical principles of the sacred law. Um, uh, but, you know, how I'm understanding ethics in a sort of general English understanding is, you know, what kind of person is it that you're trying to become? And so for me, the, the central preoccupation of of uh, conversations around ethics should be the conversation of adab. Um, and, um, you know, in, in other words, it's about a, a, a process of personal human transformation. And yes, that has an effect on the society. Um, but by and large, I wanted to make the point <clears throat> that the purpose of this transformation of human character and the acquisition of disposition as knowledge um, was not the remaking of hu ethical human beings in a particular image that the state had affixed to them, that, that the, the purpose of such ethical transformation was to be better servants of God, not better servants of the, of the state. And I, you know, I think what's interesting is that there's a sort of modernist epistemology that undergirds or that sort of instrumentalizes this conversation around ethics um, and puts it in service to the state, even if that are, you know, is done by Islamist ideologues. Um, uh, in fact, it's a very modernist epistemology. Um, and so the basic point about um, adab, uh, about the acquisition of disposition then is that it's a, it's a, it's a two, there are two parts to this discussion, right? And this is why I'm using words like disposition and not words like etiquette or, <clears throat> although I, you know, sometimes I, I, I substitute different words, um, or behavior, you know, good, good manners. Um, because yes, it does mean that you are restraining the nafs, right? It's a refinement of the self, of the character. Um, but that refinement, so that refinement of the character is certainly gonna have um, implications for how you deal with other people, but it's more importantly going to have implications about how you deal with um, with God. So you know the idea of adab would certainly uh, entail one's manners and ethical comportment with one's fellow beings, not only human beings but all the uh, creation of God. Um, but more importantly, would 
uh, entail one's correct comportment on the on the path to God. Um, and this is encapsulated by you know sayings of various Sufis such as you know who who arrives in the divine presence without adab is sent back to where he came from, right? In other words, if you're claiming a spiritual state and that you haven't mastered um, good comportment with God and with the creation, then your claims are meaningless. Um, and so what I'm most interested in then is this concept of um, um, adab as this idea of, you know, on the one hand of restraining the nafs, restraining the ego self, the, the lower self, um, as, but not as a, um, a methodology of, of imprisonment of the self, uh, but as actually a, um, a transcendent um, uh, experience, right? In other words, you restrain your nafs in order to liberate the ruh, right? You restrain your ego self so that your true self can actualize its full potentiality. Um, and that's something that I really explore. Um, I, you know, I, I, I talk about that, the, the idea of the human macrocosm or human microcosm um, and what the, the nature of, you know, what, what is the meaning of acquiring the knowledge of God for the human being. And, you know, and, uh, Sheikh Hassan, uh, one time he was asked, he said, you know, what is the, what is the greatest name of God? And Shaykh Hassan said, you know, basically quoting the statement of Abu Hassan al-Shazari, he said, it's not important what, that you know the greatest name of God, is that you become the greatest name of God. And the same, because then whatever you say will be the greatest name of God. In other words, you have the um, power of the sarraf, what you say is. Um, and this, of course, is a very extraordinary idea that emerges from Sufism. I, I don't mean to pretend it's not contra, uh, uncontroversial. Um, and so I, I wanted to just um, sort of conclude my initial statements here before finding out more about you and hearing your questions um, is uh, to quote from you from, I think I, I included some of this statement from the Jawahir Mani, which is the sort of um, early 18th century, late. Uh, or sorry, early 19th century, late 18th century primary source for the Tijaniya that informs lots of Shay Rahim's teaching in Senegal. Um, and he's explaining this hadith um, that many of you have probably heard about, a hadith Qudsi, where God says, when I love a servant, I become his hearing with which he hears, the sight with which he sees, his hand with which he strikes, the foot with which he walks. And so this is a central narrative then to my new book, uh, Realizing Islam. And so Shayam Tijani, uh, the founder of the Tijaniya, um, he says, you know, basically when, when the meaning of, I, of until I love him is as follows. God's love for a servant entails the flood of love upon him from God's holy essential being. And this is the most exalted of favors. And this is where, where the journey of all travelers ends. Whoever arrives here has all of his worldly and otherworldly needs completed. When he said, when I love him, he is saying, I overwhelm him in love of my essential being. Um, were it not for his love for them, they would have not arrived at the love for his essential being. Uh, and as for his words, and when I love him, I am his hearing to the end of the narration. The meaning is as follows. The servant sees in himself a divine power as if he were the divine sacred essential being with all of its attributes and names as if he were he, but he is not he. However, the God, however, God, the glorious and exalted has poured on him of the light of his attributes and names in order to raise his station. Thus, he comes to carry what the entirety of the creation cannot carry because of its weight. This is why some of the Gnostics have said, the one for whom is unveiled a grain's worth of Tawheed or divine unity carries the heavens and the two earths in his eyelashes because he has been raised to the station by divine power. He sees by God as if his bodily presence was the essential being of God, the exalted, and he hears by God. The indication of seeing and hearing by God is that in one glance, he sees all of existence from the divine throne to the earthly canopy with not a single grain hidden from him. He fulfills what is due to each existence from behind and in front to the right and left above and below. He sees all of this in one instant and he sees existence as a unique jewel of extraordinary apportioning 
any seas free of mirrors that would change its state's composition, movement, or color. All of this he sees in one glance, in one instant, in every direction without mistaking a single grain. The reason for this vision is that the eye of the spirit has been opened, or the ruh. If the eye of the spirit should be opened in his bodily presence, all the creations and worlds appear before him and not one vision is confounded. And this is the meaning of seeing by God. And he goes on to explain what it means to hear by God, to strike by God, to walk by God. Um, and so this kind of relates to this idea of akhlaq. What does it mean to now um, have proper akhlaq from this perspective, right? And this is this famous Sufi saying, you should dakhalaq bi akhlaq illa, right? You should um, um, endow your own character with the character with the character traits of God. Well, what are the character traits of God? Of course, they are the divine attributes. In other words, the human being can become a vehicle of transcendence outside of him or herself to obtain these, um, you know, in a limited way, uh, these the power of this of, of God's uh, become a vehicle for for the, for the creative act essentially, um, and um, and as as is emphasized in this hadith can see with the sight of God, can hear with the hearing of God, um, and can strike with the hand of God. Um, and so this is, you know, really this idea of, for me, is this idea of tahqiq, and this is why I'm specifically invoking this idea of Islamic humanism, because, um, and, and I don't care if that it's very much different than what humanism is defined um, as in the Western tradition, which is, um, you know, yeah, in Arabic, tahqiq al insaniya, right? It's the actualization of true humanity. Um, and this is what it means to be truly human, is to experience this transcendence, to be the vehicle of, of, the, um, uh, of divine agency in the creation. And Shaykh Ahmad will further emphasize, and Shaykh Ibrahim along with him, um, that who has not obtained a semblance of this is not really human, it's just a corpse walking around. So that's all where I'll end, and um, and uh, happy to hear more about you, Professor Tayyib. I don't know how you want to structure the conversation. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. So first of all, thank you very much. I think that's a great uh, introduction and also a great opening. Uh, it does uh, sort of raise a lot of questions for me. But the way we do this is um, uh, we don't, we're not a very big group, so it's. Uh, but I think it will still make much more sense if you just want to. Uh, raise your hands, you know, your electronic hand, your, your virtual hand, if you have a question, and uh, then we can, uh, you know, I'll, I'll pick it up from my side. If I miss it, then uh, Allah will help me. But um, yeah, so first of all, I think thank you very much you know, for writing this book, as well as uh, now, you know, sharing with us some of your insight and of your, of the questions, some of the major questions that have uh, you know that have animated your work as such so i have a lot of questions i'm not going to ask i'm not going to be the only one to ask questions and, and comment but uh, and i hope that this will be a continuing conversation and not just one that will end uh, in an hour but um, what i would maybe the first one i'd like to ask you is because you you raised this question i picked it up today i read the introduction again and i didn't get it the first time but i saw the you know it, because when in my, when my first reading, I thought, oh, yes, and you, you, you're clearly aligning yourself with, you know, with Weir and Sabah Mahmoud. So I said, okay, we sort of, I sort of put you there <laughs> initially. But then when I read it today, I realized, no, no, you didn't want to do that. So uh, I'm not seeing it as a criticism uh, of, of the others as such. But I mean, I, I wonder if you want to talk more about it from, a, from what, what I could see was a, you know, theoretical movement, because you you know, I think it was very clear that you didn't, was it, was it a sort of a conscious decision that you don't use a, a term that, that has a particular history, right, in social sciences, you know, uh, you know, whether it is, you know, the, uh, it, it's, it has been quite common for people to speak about embodiment against the kind of disembodiment. So you're basically caught up in this kind of, you know, dialectic and what I thought you were doing was, was trying to get out of it in a way. But I don't know if that is a, a, an accurate representation of what you, was, what you were doing there. So that's what I saw. So maybe if you, could, if you, if you want to comment on that, and then I'll just wait for the others to come. OK. Um, yeah, thanks for putting it better than I probably did. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I, I, that's very much what I w was interested in. And, and among the, the problems of that dialectic, I mean, I, I see how that's generative and I see why it's important to, um, to, to, to follow that arg argument to a certain extent. Um, and, you know, I, I do, um, I think it is interesting to think about, you know, differences in ideological articulations within the Muslim world today as being, you know, beyond a, a question simply of theology, right? It, it's, it's, it's questions of um, how one is constituting or thinking about the human being in relationship to, to knowledge. Um, but, you know, one of the, the problems of this um, explicit dichotomy also, and this is something that, you know, I, you know, quite honestly, I didn't explore as thoroughly as I could or, or you know, should have probably in reference to the other side, the sort of disembodied poaches of, of Salafism. But there, but others have done that elsewhere, you know, which is to sort of recognize that, in fact, person-to-person -person knowledge transmission um, is often important within Salafi traditions also. Um, and by, um, on, on the other side, um, is not as if um, rational reflections upon textual pronouncements are entirely absent from so-called traditional articulations, right? Um, so I was basically trying, I, I wanted to think about this idea of disposition because the sort of rigorous use of um, embodied epist epistemologies it's kind of like a substitute for Louis, Louis Brenner's idea of the esoteric versus the rationalist epistem. Um, and I think that's generative to think about along those lines. But you know, one of the problems of thinking about this idea of epistemic rupture or these two distinct epistemic categories um, is that one can't sort of get out of that. If one is within the esoteric or embodied camp, then how does one think about uh, you know, how do we think about scholars that are traditionally trained, that are Sufis, that are arguing about, you know, the reliability of different hadiths or, you know, um, engaging in this sort of textual criticism that we normally associate with what are sort of Salafis. Um, and the fact is that they are doing that. So I like to think about, you know, um, basically having, uh, this is why Bourdieu's concept of the kind of the artist was, the habitus of the artist was useful for me, right? Because he thought about these different fields in which an artist acquires these, uh, internalizes certain dispositions and certain skill set within that field and then can reproduce them within that field. But, the, you know, there's no um, presumption that uh, when that artist is in a different field or with different um, uh, standards of knowledge production um, that that artist cannot now adjust to, to having different types of um, um, you know positionalities in, in, in relation to that knowledge or, or different types of dispositions. So um, that's what was um, I think important for me in that conversation. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, thank you. Yes, it does definitely make sense. Uh, um, anyway, so I'm, I'm really happy to, yeah. to meet all of you. If you don't, I have this, um, very few of my students in Qatar will turn on their screens, but, um, and I understand, because I've been on the other side of that, and sometimes you can know, never be ready. But if you, if, you, if you don't mind, I'd love to see you um, as you're seeing me. Um, and, and, and also, I'm happy to hear any questions, regardless of whether you're showing your screen or not. Well, we have a question, a hand up from Aslam. So, yeah, thank you very much. Leo, how are you doing? I'm doing okay. Very good. <laughs> hey, Aslam. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a really intriguing book, and uh, thank you so much for, for writing it and sharing it with us. Uh, I think uh, this issue of embodiment is something that uh, we've been grappling with specifically in our group for. Uh, close on to two years now. And uh, uh, the one thing that strikes me is perhaps you can even speak about a politics of embodiment because uh, there is obviously a manifestation of authority behind uh, all kinds of claims that come out of 
being an embodiment of the Quran, if I can put it in that, uh, in that sense. So uh, for the political Islamists, uh, the state becomes the, the embodiment of this religious ideal. And obviously it then has a certain uh, authority uh, with which it speaks. Uh, for the Sufi master, it is the sheikh that is now this embodiment. Uh, for the Salafi, uh, it becomes the emulation of the prophet where we have this um, embodiment of authority. Uh, when we look at Salah Mahmoud and some of her work on, uh, uh, you know, uh, women's piety groups, we see that uh, this embodiment really is something that is manifest in everyday life with a person, uh, in her case, uh, these women that are striving towards a certain moral ideal. So uh, it seems to be a complicated process. Uh, the sense I get is when we look at it within the structure of Sufism, it seems to be more uh, hierarchical, more ordered. So I'm just thinking uh, aloud about, you know, what you would think about these various manifestations of embodiment beyond the Sufi tradition within, you know, uh, political Islam, with the Salafis, with everyday Muslims. <clears throat> Um, yeah, well, what I think about, what I think is interesting about the Sufi understanding of the sacrality of the human being, if you want to put it that way or another way, and uh, Rudolf Weir has this uh, wonderful example that he uh, got from one of his students after writing the book, and I've heard him give it in a lecture, he, he was talking about um, a person who was close to finish the mem finishing memorization of the Quran in Pakistan. Uh, and he goes to the barber, gives his haircut, and the barber asks him, you know, when are you going to finish? And he says, well, I'm going to finish, you know, before the next time I see you, in other words. And the, and the barber says, well, this is the last time that I can cut your hair without being in a state of wudu, in, in a state of ritual abolition. Um, and so um, that sort of concept of the human being's ability to... Um, um, actualize, um, um, you know, the, the I want to say actualize divinity, but actualize a, a, a state of sacrality or to, to, to be in this state of walaya or proximity to, to God through this um, a knowledge acquisition. Um, that's something that I, I see um, manifested in the Islamic, the Orthodox Islamic tradition uh, throughout. And, that, and that's one of the arguments that I was trying to make, right? That's something that's clear in traditional understandings of Maliki fiqh acquisition or, and Quran acquisition, uh, even theological principles, principles within the Ashari tradition. Um, and yes, all of this is about uh, um, embodying or, or exemplifying the prophetic sunnah, right? but in a way very different than the Salafis are doing it, right? So the Salafis are thinking about that authority and that sacrality existing within the text, not within the human being, right? And that's the sort of fundamental difference. Um, and so I really see it as sort of two major differences, but you know, with the caveat that I pointed out earlier, which is that these are um, sort of amorphous frontiers rather than fixed, uh, boundaries, sort of polarities. Um, so yeah, and and I think you know the the question of authority is is a good one. Um, I would just sort of make the sort of overall observation that authority questions of authority can never be absent from human societies, right? So the recognition that discussions about so-called embodiment or knowledge act actualization within the Sufi tradition also carry with them conversations about authority, um, you know, is to simply recognize that it's not a question of, of uh, rigid, you know, sheikhs, you know, Sufi sheikhs sort of um, being power hungry. It's a sort of recognition that societies have sort of come to certain consensuses at certain historical periods about what constitutes the legitimate authorities that they should follow, right? Is it the state? Is it, you know, uh, uh, elected political leaders? Is it 
you know, is it the scholars? And I think for the majority of human of, of, of Islamic history, um, society, Muslim societies considered their scholars as the true authorities. That, that's what gave continuity. That's what gave them the actual person-to-person uh, -person connection to the to the Sunnah of the Prophet. So, yeah. um, and later on, you know, Muslim societies thought about um, authority in different ways, constituted authority in different ways. And so this is a question about the authority of scholars and how does one actualize that authority? Thank you. Uh, I, if I could ask you a sort of, I don't know, I'm, I'm just uh, asking you a related question. I mean, the, the um, you know, the, uh, you've, you've recorded, at least you've given us a good sense of how the Tijaniya, you know, uh, you know, became became quite popular, or at least for lack of a better term, you know, during the colonial period and then the post-colonial period. I mean, to what, I mean, you didn't, so in a sense, I'm not expecting you to have done it, but anyway, one of the things that we were asking is that uh, what the social context was in which things take place, because the colonial, you know, political authority was, you know, taken away from the Senegalese and or, or, or later, was particularly problematic in post-colonial context. I mean, do you think that perhaps that is that that could be not an explanation, but could you know provide the context within which we see the rise of you know the ulama or the religious traditional religious scholars? Because there was a time in the 1960s and 70s, you know, when you when in a sense, I mean, when you thought that people which we now call political Islam were really the representative, you know, of a Sahwa Islamia, you know sort of a resurgence of Islam. I mean, how do you, how do you see that, uh, that, that, that kind of uh, competition or maybe the, or, or at least maybe the kind of different trends in Muslim societies, perhaps in Senegal uh, particularly, or you know, perhaps uh, if, if, you, if you'd like to make a comment broadly as well. Because the, the Islamists were you know, opposed to the, the secular nationalists as, as it were. I mean, they would say, put, put religion in the, in, in the center, for example. And in a way, I see this. Do you see this as a, as as a, as as? Can we see that of this as maybe people just ignored, you know, the Sufis, or do you think the Sufis really came into their own after, you know, the whole post-colonial context was, was settled in a way that was no longer contested, but still problematic in a way. Anyway, I hope you, you can see the question there. But how do, what, what do you, what does one do with the social? And the, and the historical in the narrative that you have shared with us. Maybe in a, in, in a, in, if I can encapsulate that question in that way. All right. Um, so there's a lot, a lot at stake in, in that question. It's a really awesome one. Um, and I don't, you know, if, if uh, I'm going to make a few comments, but I'm mostly going to refer you to chapter, uh, chapter one of the, the, this book, which is, is, you know, clerical communities in West African history, um, in which I, I try to track the emergence of, you know, Try to situate these practices within um, the history of West African societies. But I want to make a few comments first. Uh, you know, first of all, is the sort of we have to recognize that in our assigning the microphone of Islamic dynamism in the modern times to Salafis or modernists or the Muslim Brotherhood or whatever group coming out of uh, the Middle East is a racist mischaracterization of what's going on um, in the 20th century, right? This group, this Sheikh, you know, if, if, inter uh, if internal estimates are accurate, had 60 million followers at the time of his death in 1975. Um, Muslim Brotherhood at its height had 500,000 affiliates. Um, the Tijaniya claims to have upwards of 100 million or some estimates are much higher uh, followers around the world today. That would that's larger than any other Muslim network, Muslim group, Muslim community in in the world today. But because of its primary location in Muslim uh, in Black Black Africa, um, it doesn't get the same sort same sort of uh, radio play that um, any any group. I mean, what what is Al Qaeda? Al Qaeda. <laughs> is is nothing compared to 
you know, the, the deep entrenchment that uh, in, in popularity of, of these other types of movements. So it's not only the Tujania, I don't mean to say that, but there's many other um, communities. The next thing I would say is that Sufism in a West African context, and I, I was trying to subtly argue that, you know, I certainly do want to talk about Sufism is constitutive of these uh, understandings, but it's, it's not solely explicative of what's going on, right? That Sufism, particularly in a West African context, um, really emerges out of this dialectic between the ulum and um, uh, between these, and it's essentially a representation of kind of Islamic traditional practices, though I know that's a sort of con contested category also. Um, and, but, you know, mostly I, I want to agree with the um, comment that Professor Abdul Qadir Tayyib has, has pointed out, which is that these communities um, have a history, right? These communities um, come to fruition uh, within a particular historical moment. Um, and, you know, particularly the, the history of um, clerical relationships with the state in West Africa is very, very instructive, right? So, so basically we're thinking about, you know, different stages. The first stage is really, um, is something that you can probably see at work if you read the Turikh, uh, Turikh Sudan or the Timbuktu Chronicles, right? Where you see the sort of, um, scholars in this constructive relationship with the state, they're separate, but yet they're called upon to, um, to provide certain services. And in return, they're given land and wealth and, and even slaves. Um, uh, and, but they have, you know, and what emerges as the sort of um, ideal polities of Islamic polities of West Africa break down. Hold on a second. Um, so what emerges after you know the collapse of the Songhai Empire, is um, a, a more and, and, and basically I, I also think that this can be located much earlier. I think at the end of the Timbuktu Chronicles, uh, you can see that the scholars are upset with the way that political uh, the political establishment has been conducting itself, uh, and I think that the Moroccan uh, invasion may have actually delayed the clerical revolution um, that that really got going at the end of the 17th century in Bundu, modern day Senegal. Um, and this was, you know, all of these clerical revolutions are essentially connected. You know, the the so-called Okela faith, the Jihad of El Hajj Afuti, um, they're connected not only by people, they're connected by networks of knowledge transmission, by similar curriculums, by similar um, and sometimes similar ethnic groups. Um, so, you know, what happens is a sort of deterioration between um, the clerical establishment, the, the ulama class, uh, and political authority that really um, reaches a climax right on the eve of colonial uh, conquest, right? And so basically what's happening here is a revolution in West Africa that is overturning the ancien regime, the nobility, um, and largely, you know, largely implicated in this is the transatlantic slave trade, which is um, exacerbating uh, tensions between um, um, the sea and the and nobility. And it's not as if, I don't mean to presume that, you know, the, the Muslim scholars of West Africa are exactly abolitionists in the way that we think about it today, but certainly um, the immediate cause for all of these jihads was the capture and sale of um, of Muslims into, into slavery and into more so even in, in selling across the Atlantic. Um, that was something that was unacceptable, right? You put a walking Quran in chains, right? And as Rudolf Weir puts it. Um, so what happens with, um, and, and, and so basically the, the previous arrangement that had existed in West African societies, the sort of, um, uh, 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 the, uh, in, in the sort of agreement between the nobility um, and the, the scholars, the nobility are seeing the scholars as a version of a caste group. In other words, they're, they're a power association, right? They're handled on power. We need them, but we fear them, right? We need their powers for writing prayers and protecting us and praying for the rain or whatever the services of writing, other services of writing that could be provided. Um, but we want to make sure they don't get too close to power so that they don't destabilize and mostly so they don't siphon off our popular 
um, foundation, uh, you know, building upon ideas of wealth and people um, that are articulated as foundational for understanding West African history. Um, in other words, you voted with your feet, right, people? So what happens with the, with the revolutions is that these nobilities are delegitimized and they're further delegitimized by uh, various versions of indirect rule that come in uh, with colonial conquests and the French and the British don't actually know what's happening, right? And this is why you, you get this mistaken notion that colonial conquest actually um, increases the spread of Islam. It's not what happens, right? The colonial powers have explicit policies to restrict the spread of Islam, but Islam does spread. Why does Islam spread? Because the nobility has been eradicated, right? And the nobility, thinking about the scholars as a casted group, had circumscribed popular ability to access these groups. And so with their demise, um, scholarly communities are now flooded with previously casted peoples, previously enslaved peoples, peoples that for a variety of reasons had been held at arm's length from acquisition of, of honor through uh, Islamic knowledge acquisition. So this is why one of the, the un, uh, kind of ambiguous parts about West African history, Islam has been there for a thousand years, but it doesn't you know, get to be, uh, we, there's continuous conversations around conversions. And I think many of these conversions are, are really people um, uh, getting a deeper understanding of Islam. And they may have already had a sort of nominal affiliation to Islam, but because of their inability to access um, uh, the scholarly exemplars, they are not um, uh, you know, practicing Islam perhaps in, in the way that they would later uh, consider orthodox. Um, so this is my understanding then of how um, these scholarly communities um, emerged at the eve of colonial conquest as these essential or core interlocutors with uh, the colonial regime. And yes, they have to, you know, um, negotiate a sort of uh, accommodation with, with colonial powers, but in so doing, you know, and I think that's as the book progresses, I'm, I'm really staking out that claim um, that this negotiation is really on, on both sides, right? That the, um, uh, scholars such as Jay Ram Nias are agreeing to um, non-Muslim uh, political supremacy in a very similar way that they were thinking about corrupt nobility that they had to deal with in a pre-colonial con context. And they were essentially asking for this, or their conditions were essentially the same, right? Don't interfere with our transmission of knowledge, of Islamic knowledge, right? And once the colonial powers agreed to that, um, they, they were they were fine, right? And this is where you have, you know, statements that Shay are articulating. You know, a believer can live for a long time in a place with no faith, but he cannot last long in a place of no justice. Um, so didn't it does not matter then what the sort of confessional identity of the political overlords are, as long as they're agreeing to certain common understandings of justice. You're I muted. have to unmute myself for that. Uh, thank you, thank you for that. I I want you to you know just pick up on that. For example, one of the things, one of the words that you use, which was quite interesting and intriguing for me, was the use of uh, that the, the, you you use the word Muslim identity in quite a, in, the, in the last in the last couple of chapters. You know, you I I wanted to know how do you sort of uh, how does how do these two relate to each other? On the one hand. Ma'arifa, or you know, sort of tahqiq realization, and on the other hand, a, a Muslim identity, for example, on 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 issues like, say, Muslim personal law in Senegal, you know, um, or you know, other ways in in which the representation of Islam in the public sphere. Or am I? I I, I just wanted to know if you have a comment about that, about that too. I sort of thought of that as a, as a, as a way of beginning to understand. You know the political uh, position of the of the teacher, which which uh, which I which which I think I sort of was uh, was asking myself. Okay, what does this now mean? You know. But I see there are some two hands up here, so maybe if you don't want to ask, go to that one. I can ask the others too. 
All right. Yeah, I'll think about that one. The... <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. All right. Ala, please go ahead. And I'm going to also put uh, my video, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, thank you for this presentation and for this uh, various publication, actually, which is are very close to my own uh, research question and interest about the relation between the aesthetic experience and ethics. And overall, I take your book as an aesthetic approach to the study of ethics and of uh, Islam in Africa. And uh, of course, I was very interested by use, use of art as a, the power relation between the teacher and uh, the student are as a field of art. And when, when, when we encounter this, uh, I, I thought about, wow, what about the relation of authority which Islam had referred to? Or does this field of art allow what kind of a transformation and change in the discourse? And we know how the notion of the change in the discourse or the discursive tradition of Islam, it's also a, a, a question to which extent this field of knowledge as a, an art field might also allow us more space to hybridity and improvisation and change to this uh, uh, Islamic discourse. But I want to also question about the notion of adab, which I really like how you bring it as the character formation. And as you know, adab in Arabic refer to really the character itself, but also refer to knowledge. As, as a concept, al-adab, uh, and you know, al-adab al-Arabi, pre-Islam and after its knowledge. And here also, it's an important point in which you collapse the aesthetic and the rationale, because as you explained, you are engaging in a debate that is at the home of the study of religion and this dichotomy between the rationale and the aesthetic, it's an uh, enlightenment epistemology of a classification how we classify Africa, how we classify Sufism, and how we classify many other things. So often these aesthetic approach were relegated to a more inferior position in relation to the rational approach to knowledge. But I wanna see, I want you to comment, how do you collapse these two, the aesthetic and the rational? And in relation to Adab again, to which extent these adab are required? Are it required to the extent of the fana in order for me to uh, be seeing the truth, being a true sheikh? Do I have to go as far as to al fana to, uh, yani, to deny myself totally? Mutu qabla and tamutu, to die before you die, you know? And this is my question. Thank you again for your book and for all your publication. Wow, okay. I got a lot to think about. Well, um, I know we're almost out of time, so why don't I collect some, the rest of the questions? Uh, Leo, and then if other people have questions, and then I, I'm taking notes and I can yes, okay. respond to everything. Yeah, yes. Okay, let's do that. Yes. Leo, please go ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you so much for the, the presentation. Um, briefly, embodiment, unembodiment, disembodiment, I'm just trying to understand, um, could we, is there a way to make distinctions, you know, because going into Muslim communities now, you know, uh, could we just, can we talk about unembodiment, are there Muslims who are unembodied, and, um, and Muslims who are embodied, how do you know? Are there observable characteristics here? So that because when you when you talk about you know this embodiment of knowledge, embodiment of knowledge, and I keep asking myself, you know, uh, how do you know? Yeah, how do you know? And how, is it measurable? Do you have some more embodied than the rest? You know, you know, or you uh, is there a, a particular thing that says yes? Immediately you see some, you immediately you see this or observe this is embodied. Yeah, I'm, I'm aware of the declarations. Um, and the references made to different scholars, but I'm trying to ask myself, um, is there any externalization or something you can measure or observe that actually encapsulates this embodiment? Then lastly, um, are there no different ways of embodiment? Are, are they, 
you know, as you move from rural to urban, as you move from learned to unlearned, as you move from young to old, as you move from, uh, you know, uh, let's say disciples to followers, sheikhs to sheikh, tradition to tradition. So are we just looking at embodiment as a, a monolithic? Yeah, thank you. All right, so I'm, I'm gonna just, are there any other questions? Uh, it doesn't seem like that at the moment. I don't see anybody has hand up. Yeah, please go ahead. All right, well, I haven't heard from all of you, but I can already tell this is a yeah. really brilliant group and I, I really thank you for these provocative questions. I'm gonna start with the last one first. I mean, so the ways that I thought about this originally, um, so, you know, I'm, I'm a convert to Islam, I'm converted to Islam in, uh, in Senegal in 1997. Um, I went back, yeah, I'm also American. I went back and, uh, you know, experienced, lived in New York City for a bit um, uh, and experienced, you know, Islam in New York in the late 90s before 2000, um, 2001, uh, with when the Salafi kind of movement was at its height in New York City. And so the ways that I originally thought about this were you know, um, say asking Sheikh Hassan a, a question about what should Muslims wear, you know, or, and him sort of looking at you and smiling, you know, um, and, and then sort of you, you kind of instinctively know the answer, which is just of humility, you know, um, versus, you know, experiences in New York City where, you know, if your pants at that point came down past your ankles, people would go around with a stick while you're praying and smack your, hit your legs, you know, because your pants were longer than their understanding of a text, right? Um, not understanding that the, the text about, you know, the hadith about pants or clothes dragging on the ground had to do with the people who were trailing, you know, royal robes in the days of old <laughs> as being something unbecoming of, of the Muslim. So this is how I how I originally you know under understood it and and so basically I'm saying the fundamental de demarcation Leo is between Muslims who have adab and Muslims who do not have adab, right? But obviously that's too um, that's ridiculous. Um, and so I what I wanted to say and and so basically over time my understanding of that has been complicated, right? I had a very good friend uh, in Senegal who was an avowed Salafi. Um, and I was amazed that his adab was very good, you know, <laughs> and, um, and, and, and so um, I think what we're basically talking about is that um, it has mostly to do with practices of knowledge transmission, right? How is it that one acquires knowledge? How is it that one has a relationship with one's teacher? Um, but the, you know, the, the complication being that different fields of knowledge um, can have different ways of dealing with one's teacher, right? So if you're, you can have the same teacher to study marifa, to study, uh, and to study is, um, you know, uh, a fiqh or Islamic jurisprudence. But when you're studying Islamic jurisprudence, you might question him and engage in a lively debate in ways that you're not gonna <laughs> do when you're um, trying to obtain fana from yourself. Um, so I, I guess I, I know that's not a satisfying answer, Leo, but I also don't have a satisfying answer for that. Um, but, you know, there's certainly, I think when we're talking about this in an academic setting, we're, we're basically talking about different approaches to the text, whether you memorize it or not, whether you um, enact it. And so, so the, the, the example that I give in the book is sort of witnessing um, uh, people from within this community in Senegal who had you know, been exposed to this new sort of rationalized madrasa system that was taught by scholars of Azhar. There's doing that at the same time. Um, and, but then they're, when they're called upon, you know, there's a community uh, celebration and uh, the sheikhs come out and they give them their diplomas and they talk about them. And then you're expecting that. And then all of a sudden the teacher says, well, here's your real test, right? <laughs> and he gives them like four stanzas of Arabic poetry, right? And he says, now on the spot, uh, compose another four stanzas that match the rhyme and meter and ex further explain the original four stanzas, right? So it's incredible like jazz improvisation that's going on in terms of knowledge reproduction, right? 
um, yes, it includes the ability to sort of internalize that rhythm and that and to have memorized know what that <laughs> that poem means, right? You have to have memorized it. But once you memorize it, how do you explain it on the spot in rhyming verse that adds to the? That's amazing, right? And so I think for me that tries. Uh, I think that's what I'm how I would answer a la your other question. What does this mean about you know the human aesthetic in terms of um, art, uh, an artistic field, um, the human being is the art form, right? Um, and in this type of um, knowledge acquisition, being transformative, it's not, memorization is important, um, uh, mimesis is important, of course, all of these things, but there's a, a process that um, enables a certain improvisation. Um, and I, I, this is encapsulated for me in this very famous adage from the Islamic tradition, which says, Kif heitha waqafu thumasir. So get to where they got to, in other words, the previous generations, and then proceed. In other words, if you don't understand <laughs> the knowledge production of, of, of your forefathers, your foremothers, um, how is it that you're going to proceed into the present? Um, and in terms of the question of identity, um, yeah, that's a, re a really pro provocative question, Professor Abdul um, So, and I think I, tr I try to grapple that a little bit further in, in my more recent book. Um, and I'm thinking about the constituent elements of the human condition, right? I'm thinking through those, uh, the idea of the heart, of the of the occult, of the you know, of the, you know, the mind, the spirit, the secret of the human being, uh, the nafs. What does that mean? And and thinking about this conception of uh, of a shared, you know, a universal humanity that all human beings are sort of created to be the same or have the same constituent elements. Um, and so, how I think about this idea of the process of identity making as an act of becoming or you know, you have to come into yourself, right? And this is how we think about the, the different ways we think about tarbiyah, right? The Muslim Brotherhood version is that tarbiyah is an act of discipline, right? Um, like you would discipline your children, right? The Sufi understanding is tarbiyah is an act of nurturing, allowing you to grow into yourself. Very different kind of positionalities around this term. Um, uh, and so this is an idea then of uh, identity is an as an act of becoming um, that also kind of allows you to um, in some ways make equivalences, not only with all of the Muslims, not only with all of the human creation, but the creation at large. You understand that as you become um, uh, aware of the knowledge inherent in your own ruh, in your own spirit, uh, you understand that um, even if the non-believers, their bodies are disobeying God, they have spirits uh, endowed with the same knowledge that you have. Um, uh, and even if uh, an inanimate object is not endowed with free will, it is worshiping God. And if it's worshiping God, it's dressed in a spirit of life, as Shaykh Mujani would say, right? So you have a commonality, a shared um, purpose with all of creation. And so this is, I think how I would, and so I make the argument in my in my more recent book that you know I don't I I realize this is tentative and I don't want to take it too far, but um, the idea of a of a concept of human identity that very explicitly invokes the humanity of non-Muslims uh, was certainly something that would allow I, I think facilitate it to Jani communities and other traditionalist communities. Um, uh, in the African context to, to sort of grapple with the question of colonialism, what was happening, right? And it allows for Shaykh to come to that realization that you know, it's not about, uh, and another, he puts it another way in another place. He says, you know, I imagine that the human family is like one village and we all come out of our huts to agree upon uh, what's of mutual benefit to all of us in the central square, but then we go back to our own huts and we will raise our children the way we see fit. Um, so this is like a global village idea, <laughs> like long before this really became popular. Um, yeah. yeah, so that's how I think about the sort of political. Okay. Uh, yeah, so Musa, so I, you 
one more question. Yeah, thank you very much. I was just going to say that there is one, <laughs> if you if you don't mind uh, taking Musa's question. Yeah, please. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Zachary Wright, for writing this book, which I enjoyed reading a lot. And also, thank you for coming to the group to interact with us. Uh, I have two questions. The first is related to the point Aslam raised about the politics of knowledge production. Uh, the centrality of Sheikh and the strong authority they have within the Sufi is important in understanding knowledge production and transmission. And it is embodiment within the Sufi brotherhood. However, the issue of becoming in place of knowing is at the center of uh, controversies or maybe you can say contestations between the Faida community and other Sufi groups, including Tijani group who do not belong to the Faida. This is not to mention Salafi reformers. So on the other hand, when we talk about ethics, we also talk about ideas. We talk about the questions of right and wrong as perceived by Muslims. I think this is where the politics of both knowledge production and discourse of uh, ethical formation comes in. So my question is, how do you navigate these issues in your book as it arises between different Sufi communities like the Fida community and non fida community? Because in Nigeria, I know there is a lot of contestations about Hakika and there is other uh, Tijani group who are opposed to the en Hakika. And the second question quickly is during our reading, the question of methodology often come up, uh, which is intertwined in the politics of knowledge production. So I see this happening at two levels. First, among the Muslims of different backgrounds and the second at the level of writing about them. So the question is even more critical if the knowledge producer is part of the group he or she writes about. So being one of the questions that we often raise when reading every text, including yours, I was wondering if you could say something briefly about how you deal with that. I hope my questions are clear. All right, Musa, yeah, thanks. Those are awesome questions. Um, I, 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 you must have written them out. I, I really understand it. Thanks. Um, so, um, right, I, I, well, I've just written an article that uh, will be coming out, inshallah, with the Journal of Islamic Studies at Oxford um, about these differences within the Tijani uh, order around the question of tarbiyah and the acquisition of ma'rifa. And my essential conclusion is that um, in different historical moments, communities, particularly in Morocco, most exclusively in Morocco, um, found it expedient to de-emphasize public tarbiyah, in other words, public transmission of ma'rifa within the Tijani tradition. But that if you read the sources closely, you'll recognize that even people like Mamla Arabi ibn Sa'i, um, even Sheikh Ba'akili um, uh, from Sousse um, uh, in, in Morocco, they are actually engaged in giving tarbiyah to their disciples. And if you read their, their uh, text closely, you understand that Marifa, the acquisition of Marifa remains at the core of, um, or means, remains the defining element of, of Sufi practice. And so I would essentially answer the first question by saying that um, I, I think like a, a fair reading of the Sufi tradition is difficult to escape. The fact that the knowledge of God is the purpose of Sufism. If you're not getting the knowledge of God out of your Sufism, then it's not Sufism. And the way to get the knowledge of God is to have a sheikh to come between you and your nafs, right? Um, there can be exceptions to that. There can be ways to lead up to that where you don't you know, need a sheikh and you, and you engage in the prayer upon the prophet, right? But at some point, um, in most cases, uh, having a sheikh is essential for the acquisition of, of Marifa. And so a lot of these questions about the controversies surrounding the publicization of Ma'rifatullah or expressions of Hakika, uh, you know, the divine reality. Um, I think from the perspective of this, of the, the sort of Orthodox Sufi tradition, 
uh, is explained by the lack of adab, right? Is explained by the continued persistence of the nafs in that space, the, the ego self, even within the communities that are, are claiming to be eradicating it through the Sheikh disciple relationship, right? And I think, you know, this is a very human uh, predicament, right? Where um, uh, the acquisition of, you know, the, the whole idea of having a sheikh, a consummate sheikh in, in the first place is to protect you from, um, you know, uh, saying things that are unbecoming or that, um, uh, you know, entering into a space where uh, you think you're God or, you know, the, these kinds of things. And so we've seen these articulations within all Sufi communities, um, oftentimes by, you know, Al-Halaj, let's remember, was the one who said famously, Anul Haq, was a disciple of Al Junaid, and Al Junaid is asked for the fatwa that, that that licenses to kill him, right? According to the Sufi tradition, um, and so you're seeing that in Nigeria. In some cases, I've heard reports, right, where the kind of elder or or the kind of uh, I want to say the orthodox tradition is having to sort of step in within its own ranks and say, hey, you know, uh, this shouldn't be said, or or something like that. Um, so I hope that answers your first question, um, Musa. I know not completely, but hopefully uh, enough. The question about positionality, I think, is a good one. Um, and I try to be very open um, about who I am and where I stand in relation uh, to the, the people that I'm, I'm writing about. Um, at the same time, I resist sort of being the one that's exclusively asked that question. In other words, if you're going to ask me is it a problem that I'm a Muslim and I'm writing about fellow Muslims? Um, then I also want to hear you asking that question of the atheist, who's you know the, you know it's like the secular atheist, the white secular atheist never gets asked a question about positionality when he's writing about African Muslim societies, right? It's only the people that are deemed to be within or too close to those traditions that get exclusively asked about questions of positionality. So. I try to make it very clear that um, uh, you know uh, I'm I, I'm a Muslim. Um, I'm engaging and I'm participating within um, the, these practices of knowledge transmission, um, and I I want explicitly ask the reader to to read my account along with other accounts that are maybe more um, are, are are coming from a different positionality. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm hoping and I'm suggesting to the reader that um, what can be gained from a deep excavation from within inside communities um, is worth the risk, right? As long as the person is honest with who they are and where they're coming from, um, it, you know, is, is worth it. In other words, you can unearth, and, and I think, you know, um, if you read my, my book, my more recent book, Realizing Islam, essentially, well, even if I, I talk about the actual process of writing um, living knowledge in West African Islam, this obviously comes out of my PhD dissertation. I, I wrote this very elaborate grant to do uh, the research for this. When I, when I got to Senegal um, uh, early August of 2008, the, the main sheikh I was going to do the research under um, died within, within two weeks, right? Um, and I was really, you know, the whole community was in a disarray. Um, and, um, and the next sheikh, who, who the sheikh Tujani sees the imam now, and, oh, actually right before sheikh Hassan passed, he said, you know, I know you're here to do your BHD research, but what I really want you to do is uh, translate my grandfather's book. And that was the, the Kashf al Bas, right? So basically, I spent the entire, most of the time that I was there supposed to be doing PhD research, you know, staying up all night. And I'm not, a, at that point, my Arabic, I'm, you know, I'm, not, I'm not a translator, right? <laughs> I didn't thought of myself as a translator. And it was really tough, you know, to translate this book for me. And it's got poetry and, you know, it's tough. And, uh, but in that process, um, people became aware that, okay, this is what I'm doing, right? And they would come to me, come to my, I wouldn't have to seek them out, right? They would come to me and start telling me the stories that it would actually would have taken me more than one year to collect and find these stories. But because I became marked as a person that was in service to, to, the, to their community in ways that they wanted, right? Rather than ways that I wanted, um, they came and gave me much more than what I could have 
gone out and, and found. And another way in which that, you know, I know many of you are thinking about research methodologies yourself. Another way that that um, really benefited me is over time, you know, I've been in Qatar for the last 11 years. I've uh, twice a year, I've tried to visit um, Senegal and, and Morocco and other places and spent sometimes the entire summer there. Um, uh, my ability to write the, I, what I hope is the more definitive version of the history of the Tijaniya um, comes out of acquiring manuscripts that nobody else had in Sen you know, nobody else, no previous writer, Abu Nasser or uh, Alad Nani out of Morocco that wrote about the Tijaniya before me um, had access to these manuscripts. And that's because they were held in private collections, right? And to, to give you an example, I was provided access with a 49 page travel log of Shay Ahmed Tijani written in, in his own hand when he made the pilgrimage um, in 1774 and met with all the kind of scholars of the of the Tariqa Muhammadiyah movements of their time. Uh, and he records, you know, what what he received from them, the secret prayers that he received from that, et cetera. Um, and so that was like a watershed moment where I said, okay, this is really telling me something definitively different or really richer about the nature of connections between scholars in the 18th century that um, nobody has written about the Tijaniya. And perhaps nobody has written about, you know, this, I, I had, uh, I was able to push against some of the things that Ahmed Dalal was saying, although I agree with most of his book, um, Islam Beyond Europe. Um, but he, he's basically saying that these connections between scholars in the 18th century are meaningless because they had very short um, times of interaction. But because of this text, I could prove that, okay, it's a short time of interaction, but you're getting Ismail Azam from a sheikh, right? And you're preserving the memory of that for your later followers 200 years later. That's important, right? I don't care what you say. Um, so, um, so yeah, personality is just something I would just encourage you all to be honest with, with your sources, um, but, and, 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 but also truthful. Like it, the person who tries to misrepresent themselves within academia thinking that they're gonna, you know, um, uh, get a, an advancement by positioning themselves closer to what they think is the academic ideal. Um, I, you sold yourself out, <laughs> right? Yeah, and I, I think you should just be, you know, uh, the, I, the ideal for me of, of academia is that it allows for a variety of different positionalities and together we can uh, then arrive at something closer to the truth because we have all of these different voices together and we can think about a neutral space in which we can exchange knowledge, right? I'm not, uh, in, in talking to you, I'm not asking you to become a Muslim. I'm not asking you to, <laughs> To, be, to take a sheikh and, and acquire the knowledge of God, right? Um, I'm trying to get you to understand the sort of Muslim identity or positionality of, you know, of, of, of perhaps 100 million Muslims in the world, <laughs> many of whom are Black African. Right? Thank you, Zachary. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much, uh, Zachary. I think that was a really great uh, place to, to conclude the session. I don't see any hands up. I'm not going to invite anybody else now, but just uh, I think it's a very interesting comment with which you concluded. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm a little bit tempted to say that, uh, I mean, it does speak about the difference between, you know, the realization of realization tahqiq and, you know, and, and academic uh, discourse perhaps. Um, so, but, I, well, but we, leave it, we leave it at that, you know, to say that, this is how we think about, at least in the university, the academies, you know, for what they worth, you know, they, they do uh, produce knowledge in a, slight, in a different way. Uh, so I leave, you, I, I leave that basically not only for yourself, but for all of us just to, just to reflect on that, to think about that. But I think thank you very much for opening up or at least for sharing with us, you know, this rich history of living, living knowledge as such. I think that, and I think that, the, that you, you, your, your question that you asked about how we think about Ethics is very much, you know, what you were looking at because we're looking at these, these various terms that have been, you know, developed in Islamic intellectual history, and we want to relate them a little bit more to contemporary societies, contemporary social social theory. So that's what attracted us really to your book, that we think about, you know, uh, uh, you know, just uh, uh, you know, because we had previously read a book on on Salafism by Terje. Um, Ostebo, you know, in, uh, in Ethiopia. So we thought that, you know, that was, we, we thought that we wanted to sort of, you know, look at another full length study on a, 
on, on perhaps a different, uh, what we call a different manifestation or different trajectory. And so I think this is why this is how we basically look at the look at the work as such. But I think it will take some time. By the time, like as you suggested, we have to bring a lot of perspectives together to see, you know, to to, to perhaps get a get a better sense of it. Yeah. But sometimes we're always tempted to think maybe we have to give all of this up and join the tariqa as well. So we can we can think of that as as maybe not as competition, but it's a different way of of, of thinking about knowledge as such. That the, the the university or modern academy is not the only way that one thinks about knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, so, I'm really honored by you, you reading the book. I'm really impressed with this, the, the, this reading group. Um, and, you know, uh, you're, you can get my contact from Professor Abdelkader Ad anytime. I'd be happy to talk to you further. Yeah. You're, you're, you're blessed to have such a um, mm -hmm. professor among you. I know Professor Tayo for some time now, and I'm deeply respectful of, of what he's doing in his research. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, shukran. Thanks very much for that. Okay, so I think we'll we'll close the meeting now. It's sort of gone dark in my room here, but I don't know where the light switch is. So I just switched on my phone, so, you know, light switching just so that you can see me. Uh, but uh, thank you very much, all of you, for joining us. And uh, we'll send you a notice. We have this meeting once a month. So we'll uh, we'll we'll no notify you. But uh, we we haven't decided on our next book, which we will start next Thursday. So we'll also just we'll, we'll notify all of you who want to join us. So. Zachary, once again, you know, thank you very much and have a good evening and uh, greetings and salams to your family and everybody. Okay, thank you very much. Salam alaikum.